Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn. We are so glad you're joining us for 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. It is our privilege to study, to present to you, and we do this for you. So thank you for joining us. Let me introduce you to the other Bible students sitting at the table, my brothers and sisters in Christ, Daniel Perrin. Thank you. I have Monday's lesson called Jesus Interpretation, dealing with interpreting the parables. Wonderful. And Pastor John Lomacain? I have Tuesday's lesson, The Reason for the Parables. The Reason. And Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Lamp and Measuring Basket. That's a good one. And my dear sister in Christ, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. I have Thursday, Parables of Growing Seed. This is going to be an exciting study. James, would you like to have our prayer to open? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, again, we just want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word and for the opportunity we have to call upon the Holy Spirit to teach us and to be with the viewers. Guide and direct us as we study this week's lesson. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, if you're following along in your adult Bible study guide, we are in lesson four. This is parables. Let's look at our memory text together. This is Mark 4, 24 and 25. Mark 4, 24 and 25. Then he, Jesus, said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So in other words, he is saying that the measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of knowledge and virtue that comes back to you. And this week we are studying the parables of Mark 4 as we listed here. And these are the sower, the lamb, the measure, growing seed, and the mustard seed. And by the grace of God, we're going to come away with a better understanding of Jesus' parables. I have Sunday's lesson, the parable of the sower. So if you're in Mark 4, let's begin with verse 1. I'm going to read through this. Mark 4, we'll read verses 1 through 9. And again, he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables. What is a parable? A parable is when you take cultural things and that's how you deliver a spiritual truth is using an example of a cultural thing. So he says, he taught many by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Mark 4, 4. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some 30 fold, some 60 and some a hundred. And he said to them, he who has ears, let him hear. Jesus doesn't always explain his parables. This is one he is going to explain. But when you read a parable, it is good to analyze the story so that you will get the most from it. Now, most of us know in this parable, the seed is the word of God. And I always say, your potential, let me back up. The potential of the harvest is in the seed. Plant corn, you're going to get corn. Plant wheat, you're going to get wheat. When you plant the Word of God, you're going to get what God wants for you. But I'm going to take this a little step further. The potential of the harvest is not just in the seed, 
but in the soil. So Sunday's lesson, we are going to look at four different types of soil. And the outcome of the seed relies on the soil. In three of these stories, there is a failed crop. It's, it's a failure for the outcome. Only one soil condition produces an abundant harvest. So let's, and, and I want to read this from our study guide. It says, instead of one continuous story, the parable is actually four individual stories told to completion in each setting. And the length of time for completing the story lengthens with each successive story. So let's look at this first soil condition, Mark 4.4. 4. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. So what is he saying? Some people hear the message, but their heart is burdened. Their heart is hardened. It's untilled soil. So what happens? They hear the message, and the devil comes and snatches it away, the seed of the word, because it never penetrated their heart. Now the second soil condition, Mark 4, verses 5 and 6. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. So what is, what is he saying here? Some people hear God's incredible promises from His Word, and they receive it with joy. And it's like, oh, they leave church and they're excited, but they don't cling to those promises long enough for them to take root. So the circumstances of our life, the conditions that challenge maybe their trust in God, they begin to lose faith. They reject the eternal truth of God's Word while accepting the conflicting evidence of our circumstances. Now, the third soil condition, Mark 4 and verse 7. It says, Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. To me, this is one of the most sad. Some people sow the seed of God's Word in their hearts. And for a while, they are focused on Jesus. The roots of faith are, are beginning to really take hold, and it's nurtured for a while. But then the demanding hustle and bustle of life mm -hmm. interrupts their focus. Mm -hmm. And worldly matters begin to creep in. And what happens when the worldly matters creep in? They're like weeds and they begin to grow out of control and it overcomes our thoughts. How sad that we would be nurturing the Word of God in our hearts and then suddenly the weeds and thorns of the world begin to choke that Word. It just chokes the life of God's Word. We quit trusting in His knowledge and we return to our own limited human understanding. So what happens? Our growth as a Christian is stunted, mm -hmm. and it's, we no longer acknowledge God's way of bringing us to maturity. So here's the point. If you ever quit tending to the fertile ground of the kingdom of God within you, guess what's going to happen? You're going to sacrifice the good seed. So now the fourth soil condition. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and even a hundredfold. So the Word of God that is planted in good ground are those who once they have received that Word, they've heard the Word, they've planted that seed in a heart that has been repentant, it's tilled up, and then they hang on to that word. They persevere. 
Oh, Jesus said only those who persevere to the end mm -hmm. are going to make it. Mm -hmm. But you've got to persevere to produce a good crop. So the bottom line is our hearts have to be good soil. They've got to be prepared for the planting. Right. And then we need a broadcasting system, a way, you know, they used to broadcast the seed back in this day. But we need a way, more than one way, to hear the Word. We hear it through sermons, we watch 3ABN, listen to the radio or a podcast, but you've got to get into the Word. And I'll tell you what I do. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm all alone. I read it out loud. Faith comes by hearing and hearing mm -hmm. by the Word of God. There's something about reading aloud that helps you to retain the promises of God. But then we have to persevere. When our circumstances look opposite of the Word of God, we can't give up on God. We have to know, and, and you know, the hardest thing sometimes is for us to believe that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. But God has promised in Philippians 1, 6 that He will complete the good work He's begun in us. So we have to hold on to His promises, persevere. Mm -hmm. Now, let me read from the Adult Bible Study Guide. I love this part. He said, the seed that falls on the good soil takes the longest of all, mm -hmm. presumably an entire growing season, as is the normal pattern for a crop. Sometimes we expect the crop to spring up overnight. Three of the stories are about failure. Only the last is about success, a good abundant crop. The length of the stories the longer and longer period of time for each successive story. And the fact that only one story is about success all point to the risk of failure, but the abundant outcome of success. The parable seems to point to the cost of discipleship and the risks involved, but the abundant reward of following Jesus. Remember, all of his potential, all of your potential is wrapped inside his seed. You've got to get that seed planted in a heart that has been tilled up through repentance and receive what the Lord has for you. He will be the one to produce a, an abundant harvest in your heart. Amen. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have Monday's lesson called Jesus Interpretation, specifically dealing with his interpretation of this parable of the sower. And then even more broadly, the lesson deals with principles of interpretation. How do we, how do we go about taking what Jesus said and understanding and then applying what it means? Now the lesson did a really good job of summarizing Jesus' interpretation and I'm not gonna try to, to reproduce that for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna move into the area of how to interpret. Now everybody heard, everybody who was there heard the parables that Jesus spoke, but after that, then there were two groups. There were the disciples who they heard a direct interpretation from Jesus given to them. And then were the crowd who, there was the crowd who did not get an explanation of the parables. Now, which group do you think had an advantage? Which one do you think had a, a better experience or a greater benefit? You might be thinking to yourself, wow, uh, I, I've not grown up having that great dose of religious spiritual information that he or she has. I have a disadvantage from them because I've not, I, I've not heard all the things they heard growing up. Well, let's see about that. Uh, what did the crowd receive? The crowd heard from Jesus the divine life-giving words. Mm -hmm. That's what they got. And then they had opportunity and invitation to pray and ask God to reveal to them and explain to them what those things might mean for them. And then next, they went out and they experienced those parables. 
literally as they went day by day, planting the seeds, because that's what they did, and fishing on the lake, and mothers baking bread, because Jesus told stories about baking bread in the days, plural, to follow. Those things were brought back up into their minds. Mark chapter 4, verse 33 says that Jesus told them, taught them as they were able to hear it. So as they work, these things are brought to their mind. So 1 Corinthians 2, 13 even says that the Holy Spirit teaches. And so the Holy Spirit then is teaching and revealing to the crowd what Jesus himself revealed and explained to the disciples. The seed is the word, divine truth. All right, and for us, that, that is through all of this word here in the Bible. The soil is the condition of man's hearts. Now, what about the disciples? What did they receive? Mark 4, verse 34 says that when they were alone, Jesus explained all things to his disciples. Do you want a deeper understanding? Do you want a deeper understanding of the truths of God? Then find time alone with Jesus alone. Not just a moment in the morning, not just the, the daily verse that shows up on your phone. No, this is a good adequate education, it means significant amounts of time alone. And there's, the purpose here is then as you understand these things, you then have a burden and a privilege of sharing the fruits that now are growing in you. If you have a garden, don't you share the fruits of your garden? You should. If you don't, you should. Uh, to help understand the parables, though, I would really recommend a book, 29 chapters by Ellen White, called Christ's Object Lessons. It goes through each of the parables, and every single page has practical applications to your life wherever you are. Great, great, wonderful book. Now, Jesus uses a number of different uh, uh, parables, and all of them, here's what we understand, almost all of them are connected with regular life and the things that they would do. Well, you don't understand the kingdom of God, you do understand farming. Let me show you how you can find the lessons between the two of them. And farming and gardening metaphors, uh, parables are prominent. In this chapter four of Mark, three of the parables are about seeds and growing things plants. Farming never goes out of style and it never goes out of date. Everybody's got to eat, right? All right. Farming, gardening is governed by natural laws. Natural laws are God's laws and they must be followed. Gardening involves periods of labor and rest. It has a positive result and it brings joy uh, when the benefit and the results are finally received. And it's not limited by age or gender or race or belief or social standing or experience. Beginners or experts can be involved. Everyone can experience the benefit. In the working of the soil, God can teach us lessons that we have a hard time perhaps learning elsewhere as our hands and our bodies are involved. And Jesus knew this. I want to share with you some really, really exceptional statements here. Here's one from a book called This Day with God by Ellen White, page 12, paragraph 3. The cultivation of the soil is a school in which man may learn spiritual lessons. As he cultivates the soil, man is to see reflected as in a mirror the work of God upon the human soul. When we work in the garden, God is teaching us. The Holy Spirit is working in us, the seed that is sown right here. We need the quiet of the garden, even if it's just a couple plants on the windowsill or some pots out on the balcony. This is really important because anxious, hyperactive children and adults get the privilege of slowing down and caring for this tender plant the way God cares for us. And then they have the opportunity to hear God's voice speaking. And, and, and as we pray for those seeds, as we plant them and pray for those seeds in the soil, we learn how much we must pray over the seed that is planted in the soil of men's hearts and check on it every day and not be discouraged when the growth is just a little bit or maybe what appears to be none at all to us. Let me share a couple of other statements from that book, Christ's Object Lessons, I mentioned, page 88, paragraph one. In tilling the soil, in disciplining and subduing the land, lessons may constantly be learned. No one would think of settling upon a raw piece of land, expecting it at once to yield a harvest. 
earnest, earnestness, diligence, and persevering labor are to be put forth in treating the soil preparatory to sowing the seed. So it is in the spiritual work of the human heart. And we learn that through tilling the soil, through planting and harvesting. A wonderful book here called Child Guidance, page 34, paragraph two and three. The cultivation of the soil is good work for children and youth. It brings them into direct contact with nature and nature's God. How can I introduce my child to God? Get him in the garden. And that we, and that they may have this advantage, there should be as far as possible in connection with our schools, large flower gardens and extensive lands for cultivation. Why? Because we hear the voice of God revealed there. And education amid such surroundings is in accordance with the directions which God has given for the instruction of youth. And these are such good statements. And I have one more and I really want to share it. It's in the book, Education, page 111. And the same paragraph is repeated in the book, Adventist Home, page 142. Listen to this. And this is kind of a long paragraph, but it is so worth reading. In the cultivation of the soil, the thoughtful worker will find that treasures little dreamed of are opening up before him. No one can succeed in agriculture or gardening without attention to the laws involved. The special needs of every variety of plant must be studied. Different varieties require different soil and cultivation and compliance with the laws governing each is the condition of success. Will we learn about the law of God in the garden? Absolutely. The attention required in transplanting that not even a root fiber shall be crowded or misplaced. I just transplanted some stuff last week and I was thinking about this very thing. These roots, they got to go somewhere and teaching lessons into the heart here and the care of the young plants, the pruning and watering, the shielding from frost at night and sun by day, keeping out weeds, disease and insect pests, the training and arranging not only teach important lessons concerning the development of character, but the work itself is a means of development. In cultivating carefulness, patience, attention to detail, obedience to law, it imparts a most essential training. See, Jesus knew this. He is sending them out to garden. I'm going to tell you the story. Go plant the seed and it's, you're going to learn. The Holy Spirit will teach you the constant contact with the mystery of life and the loveliness of nature, as well as the tenderness called forth in ministering to these beautiful objects of God's creation tends to quicken the mind, and refine and elevate the character. In my experience, when I go out and work in the garden, God reveals to me a lot of the work that he needs to do in me. Our garden has literally been an experience of blood, sweat, and tears. And sometimes when I go out there, it feels more like a battleground where I want to complain and argue and give up or quit when something doesn't work. Instead of focusing on the miracle working power of God to call forth life out of something so minuscule that how could this little black thing bring forth something so delicious? But the Lord of the harvest, he knows those things. And when you go out to plant the seed physically, spiritually, the Lord of the harvest is there watching over and strengthening your hands to bring forth good things that only come by his power. Thank the Lord for those good things. Amen and amen. Thank you, Daniel. I love your heart for the Lord. We're going to take a short break to tell you how you can get our Sabbath school panel notes from each of us. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Avian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Now we're, we will continue with Pastor John Lomacain for Tuesday's lesson. And mine is entitled, The Reason for Parables. Now my reasons may not necessarily be your reasons, but these are my reasons. <laughs> and we're going to go to the book of Mark. Mark is, as I may have referred to, he's not very well, not very plentifully spoken about uh, in, the, in the book of Acts, but he's there and we find that... Um, his words are significant. I look at Mark and I studied him before. 
I use this phrase, the underdog disciple, because he, he, he's the cheerleader. He would be the guy, he would be the disciple that if you are running toward the finish line, he would say, I know your knees are hurting, but you can make it. And in his life, he was that person that always saw in a very adverse set of circumstances, something positive to encourage the person participating. And that's why when he, we talked about some of the things he dealt with in the controversies, he's always highlighted how in the middle of all the controversies, Jesus is still the Lord of all. But sometimes for the benefit of the advancement of the kingdom, Jesus had to wrap his messages in parables. And let's, so, let's go to the book of Mark chapter four, and we're going to look at verses 10 to 12 to lay some foundation here. Just, just three verses, 10, 11, and 12. And so I begin with verse 10. But when he was alone, and this is continuous, he spoke parables, the parable of the sower that we just talked about. But now when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. And then in verse 12, so that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Now you might listen to that and say, but doesn't the Lord want them to turn? Doesn't he want them to have their sins forgiven? The Lord is talking about not a situation where he is preventing them from seeing and hearing, but where they are preventing themselves from seeing and hearing. And it's like that unruly child. And you know, you're the dad of many children. This is our on the paddle father, Abraham, wonderful man of God, wonderful family. But I remember growing up in my home. Sometimes I would hear my dad calling me and that's the least time I want to hear him right then because I know I did something that I should not have done. And so I hear his voice the first time very strong. The longer I ignore it, the more faint it gets. And um, when he finally gets my attention, he asks me a question that I think is fit, fitting to include in the book of Mark here. Didn't you hear me? Didn't you hear me calling you? Well, Jesus is speaking about those on the outside, fittingly, those who should have known long before the beginning of his ministry, what he was trying to say to them. And they wouldn't hear. They saw, but they would not perceive. Mm -hmm. they, they listened, but they would not accept it. He said in, in John 1, I came to my own and my own did not receive me. So he said there was, an, there was this inherent unwillingness to listen and this inherent unwillingness to hear. So the question is, why did Jesus teach in parables? Well, let me break out a couple of things that I saw and I pulled out from this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. One of the reasons was to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill prophecy. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables and without a parable, he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Notice to fulfill prophecy, he used parables. Some of the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah said, he's going to use parables to talk to the Jews. And why would Isaiah and Jeremiah be qualified to say that? Because Isaiah and Jeremiah were contemporary prophecies to the journey of the Israelites. He saw their recalcitrance. I mean, the book of Isaiah is a difficult book. It ends on a positive note. Jeremiah doesn't let up. He shows the recalcitrant behavior of the Israelites and he says, why don't they listen? So both of these prophets say, man, I'll tell you that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. But it wasn't kept secret to the Israelites. They had been given many understandings that their surrounding nations didn't have, but it did not benefit them. So one of the reasons Jesus continued in parables was to fulfill prophecy so that when they did not receive it, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, his hearing in those words will be fulfilled at that very moment. The other one is to reveal the condition of the listeners. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 to 15, to reveal the condition to the listeners. 
of the listeners. He spoke in parables to reveal the condition of those hearing. Verse 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, and notice now he's going to bring out their condition. Hearing you will hear and, not sh and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. Here's the condition of the hearers. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Notice, once, to fulfill prophecy. Secondly, to say, hey, I'm speaking to people whose conditions are fulfilled in my words. You know, sometimes there may be those of you that are giving Bible studies to someone, you say, man, why won't they listen? Why are they not hearing? Because there are certain things that come up in modern theology and in our modern vernacular, in our places of study, that the moment a person hears that phrase, like Seventh-day Adventists, oh, ears are shut, eyes are closed, don't want to hear it, cult, weirdos. And, and the mindset of today was a mindset that Jesus had to deal with in his day. So the Pharisees were recalcitrant because they were determined that he cannot be the Messiah and we will not hear anything he says until we know that he is who he is or who he said he is. We're not going to listen. But that was prophesied a long time before. The third reason is to open the understanding of the applicable parties. In other words, to whom it belongs, he makes it very clear. Matthew chapter 21, verse 45. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. He spoke it in such a way, like he might say, uh, throw, throw a coin in the ocean and go fish it out. Well, the fishermen will hear that right away. Jesus spoke words in Matthew chapter 21 to the Pharisees and the priests, and they, waited, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like the parable of the rich man of Lazarus, they realized he's talking to us. So sometimes he used parables to open the understanding of the applicable parties. This is who I'm talking to, and this is what I'm talking about. So he chose a topic that fit along the lines that they would understand. The fourth reason is to unfold messages that had been hidden. Mark chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, we just read that, but I read it again. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. To unfold messages, people that understood him, understood the mystery. People that rejected him, it was like talking to a wall. He kept the mystery hidden. The fifth reason is to make the message palatable. Mark 4, verse 33. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Mm -hmm. Palatable. I get it. I get it. You talk to a pilot about planes. You talk to a basketball player about sports. You don't do the opposite because they won't get it. You don't use terminologies in theology to speak to a person that's just about to garden. They don't get it. Jesus made sure that he used words applicable to those who can get it. The soul went forth to sow. The garden has got it. And the other reason, John 16, verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So he had to make sure that they were at the place where they can receive it to make sure the message is palatable. And the sixth reason is to, see his ad to keep his adversaries in the dark. Sometimes he had to do that to continue his ministry. Mark 4, verse 12 to 13, so that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear, but do not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He said, if you don't understand this, you're not going to get it. So what happens here is to keep on hearing, but do not understand, to keep on seeing, but do not perceive, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. So I pray that the word of God today to you is not a parable, but something you're ready to hear. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Great lesson. My name is James Rafferty. I Wednesday's lesson, Lamp and Measuring Basket. We're in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Let's just take a look at these verses, asking the question, what is Jesus' special emphasis in the parable of the lamp? 
Mark chapter 4, 21 to 23. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid that shall not be manifested, neither is there anything secret, but it shall come abroad. If any man have ears, let him hear. Of course, it's kind of uh, obvious this question is rhetorical. You're not going to take a candle and put it under a bed. That would be dangerous. And you're not going to put it under a bushel either. But in you, when you think about this in the context of the gospel message, God has actually given to all people some form of light. In John chapter 1, verse 9, we're told that Jesus Christ is the light that lights every single person that comes into the world. So in a sense, as Pastor John was saying, God gives truth to everyone in different measures. And he communicates this truth to us in order for us to make a beginning. We all need a beginning. Whatever the ground is, whatever the soil is, we all get a little bit of seed, whether it's on the wayside or in the stony ground. Wherever we are, God makes a beginning because God initiates the plan of salvation to every human being. We don't initiate anything. All of us are sinners. We have not just come short of the glory of God, but we're not even seeking after God. None of us are righteous, no, not one. So everyone who comes into the world is given light. The question is, what are we doing with it? <laughs> are we hiding it under the bed or the bushel? In other words, are we refusing to let our light shine? I would say in the bed, it would be like in the home. Right? The bed is going to be in the home. The bushel might represent the workplace, you know, where we develop uh, our money, our income, you know, out in the field, the bushel representing the workplace. So are we letting our light shine in our home? Are we letting our light shine in the workplace? And of course, we understand what happens when we don't let our light shine. Just like Jesus says here, if you put it under a bed, it's going to cause a fire. It's going to cause damage. It's going to cause trouble. It's going to cause loss. And that is really the inevitable result of hiding the light that God has given us, that God has given to each one of us. God is calling us to share the light, even if it's just a candlestick worth of light. Share what you know about God. Share the little light that you have. Don't hide it from your family. Don't hide it from your fellow workers. Share it because people need to see God and they need to see God in you, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why we have a new week intensive here at 3ABN called SOD, School of Discipleship. So let me give you the address so that you can find out more information. It's 3abnsod.com, and you will really be blessed in learning how to let that light shine. Going back to our text, the other part of this verse says, there's nothing hid that shall not be manifest, neither is there anything kept secret that shall not come abroad. When we think about this, we want to reference this to the fact that there is a day ahead of us when all of us who have been given light, and that's everyone, is going to have to reveal what has been done with that light. Whether it's something that we've kept secret and under a bed or whether it's something that's been made manifest, the record books of heaven will be opened and every secret sin, every secret thought will be exposed. This is what Ecclesiastes says, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so Jesus says, don't hide your light under a bed. Don't hide your light under a bushel. There is going to be a day of accountability for the light that God has given you because that light is precious. Not only is it precious light from God to you, but it is precious light through you to others. As you allow light to shine through you, it has a powerful impact upon people around you because you as a human being can witness for God in ways that are unique to who you are. And so God is wanting, is expecting you to let that light shine. You may say, well, I haven't been a good light bearer for God. I haven't been a good revealer of the light for God. I've kind of been letting my light hide under that bed. I've been letting it hide under that bushel. Well, you can stop doing that. You can actually make an about turn. You can do what the Bible calls us to do and repent. In fact, in the Bible, it tells us about those people who decide to do this. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. It says, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men's follow after. 
Likewise, verse 25 says, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand and they that are otherwise cannot be hidden. God wants to hide the mistakes. Think about it. You want to hide your light. God wants to hide your mistakes. Let your light shine so He can hide your mistakes. God wants to hide all of your mistakes. He wants you to go ahead and, and open up to Him. Just open up those sins, those failures. Just give them to God so they can go beforehand to judgment. And then you're going to have an amazing amount of light that's going to shine through you because people are going to see a humble, repentant, God-fearing person walking and living in the light that God gives. And of course, as we walk in the light, as He is in light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now Mark chapter 4, 24 and 25 goes on to, to give another little uh, lesson. Jesus is driving home in the measuring basket, the parable of the measuring basket. It says here in verse 24, and he said unto them, take heed what you hear with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Verse 25. For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. It seems a little bit unfair when you first look at this. You know, if someone's got a bunch of stuff, why give them more? And if someone needs, you know, more, why are you taking away what they have? Or if someone has something, why are you taking away from them? But Jesus is looking at the use here. What is the use that we're making of the light that God has given us? God is giving us grace. He's giving us love. He's giving us mercy. He's giving us light. He's giving us truth. He's giving us a revelation of Himself. He's pouring out upon us all that heaven can bestow. And as He gives this to us, He says we need to give this or share this with others. And the more we share it, of course, the more we receive because the more we share, the more we lose or give away. And so we need more. But if we're not sharing anything, if you pull into a gas station and fill up your tank and then you go a block down the road and put pull into another gas station, you're not going to put very much gas in your tank because you haven't used very much, right? right? And so this is the point Jesus is making here. It's repeated in a, a different sense in the Gospel of Luke. And I just want to summarize this. Let's just summarize Luke chapter 6. It's really Luke's version of the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. It ends a little differently than Matthew's version does. But in verse 38, he says it this way. He says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet, with all shall it be measured unto you again. Now, I, I really like the way this verse ex exemplifies or explains the way God wants to bless us. God, first of all, is going to give to us. He's just going to give to us. Then He's going to give to us in good measure. Right? So we've got, and then we've got in good measure, and then it's pressed down. You know, when you want to make room for more, you kind of push things down a little bit. Oh, we can get a little bit more in here. And so we squeeze it down a little bit and more room is made. But then it's shaken together. And if you really want to make room, you shake it up, <clears throat> shake it up and see if some, some more room will be made there. And even more comes in. And then, of course, if you, you see what the text is saying here, God wants to give you more. It's running over. You're filling it up until it's running over and you're hoping you have some kind of container to hold all this in. In other words, God wants to just pour upon us abundantly. Now, the context of this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is all about the way we react to and treat people who mistreat us, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, blessing those that curse us, being merciful unto others who are unmerciful unto us. God is bringing out the big guns here in a sense, right? He's, he's loading us up. He's basically saying it's not just about your theology. It's not just about your doctrine. It's not just about the things that you believe and teach. It's about your character. It's about your spirit. It's about your attitude. It's about the way you relate to people who don't relate well to you. It's about how you respond to people who mistreat you. And in this context, I'm going to pour out abundantly above all you can ask or think. I'm going to give you pressed down, shaken together. I'm going to give you everything you need to withstand those negative influences and to let your light shine. So allow God to pour His grace and mercy into your heart so your light can shine brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. Pastor James, Pastor John, I was trying to get them all in together. Uh, Daniel and Shelley, thank you. What an incredible lesson. 
You know, we talked in a couple weeks ago, um, we talked about Jesus' first sermon in the synagogue there in Capernaum. And we talked about how the people were astonished because he spoke as one who had authority and not as the scribes and Pharisees did. We know that Jesus was an incredible teacher and his use of parables to me is incredible. Knowing the right time to speak the right word so that people's hearts would be open and would be receptive or the people who didn't need to hear or shouldn't hear would not understand what was taking place. To me, Jesus is the master teacher. I love this lesson as we study that. I'm Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we talk about parables of growing seed, and I have two parables taken from Mark chapter 4, and they both deal with seed, just like the initial study dealt with the parable of the sower. These are shorter parables. The first one is the parable of the growing seed. We're in Mark 4, verses 26 to 29. Mark 4, 26 to 29, and then it closes with verse 30. This parable, incidentally, is not notated in any of the other Gospels. A lot of the other ones are in Matthew or in Luke or maybe even in John, but this one's not in any other Gospel. He said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself. That word by itself, we're going to come back to it. But in the Greek, it comes from the word automatic. The earth yields crops by itself or automatically. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. So takeaway number one, growth, it requires sowing. Where are you and I supposed to sow? Somebody had to sow, right? The kingdom of heaven is as if a man goes out with the seed and he goes sowing where he goes. Where are we to sow? We are to cast our bread beside all waters. We are to sow everywhere. I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes 11. It says Ecclesiastes 11, 6, in the morning sow your seed. That's right. In the evening, do not withhold your hand. We are called to sow at all times, in all places, everywhere. We are called, you and I are called to sow the word of God in neighborhoods, in communities, in your workplace, in your home, with your children. Sow the word of God, sow beside all waters. Sow into your own life. Now, how are you supposed to sow into your own life? Study the word of God. Amen. Open up the word and allow the word to soak in. Allow it through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Allow the sowing to come into your own heart and life. And that's intentional. We can say, oh yeah, we're Christians. No, spend time in the word of God and allow the word to be sowed into your life. And in turn, sow the word into other people's lives. We have pastors on the panel. Sow into the church the flock, so the word of God, not entertainment, not the social gospel, mm -hmm. not watered down truth. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, so the word. If you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, you have a tremendous responsibility to sow the word. Takeaway number two. So number one is growth requires sowing. We have to sow. Number two, growth is not forced. You notice that little word I said, the earth produces crops by itself, mm -hmm. on its own. It comes automatically. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus speaking. What does he say there? Let your light so shine. He doesn't say strive to shine. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say struggle to shine. He doesn't say work harder to shine. He simply says, let your light shine. Mm -hmm. Christian growth is not meant to be forced. People don't grow by trying harder or being forced to grow. Church growth is not forced. Growth happens naturally because the seed has been sown, because it's being watered, as Daniel talked about, and those weeds are plucked up. There is that work, of course, involved. But don't for force growth. It will happen naturally under the right conditions. Takeaway number three, recognize 
that the growth is not on me. It's not on you. The responsibility is not on us. What does it say in the parable? The seed sprouts and grows and the farmer doesn't even know how that happens. He says, how's that happen? How does it even sprout and grow? Of course, we have a part to play. Our job is to sow the seed. But the real growth is the work of God. God is the one who grows our characters. God is the one who grows the church. We scatter the seed beside all waters. God gives the increase. And I think sometimes we worry when we don't grow. Mm -hmm. We think, oh, what's happening here? I love Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began the good work, he's gonna complete it. He's going to finish the growing process. Let's read verse 29 the end of this particular parable. When the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This reminds me of Revelation 14. Remember the harvest at the end of the world with the reaping of the grain that's righteous and then the reaping of the wicked or the grapes. Takeaway number four, the growing process is not forever. There will come a time when each person their character will be fully formed and developed, either grown, ready to be harvested for the kingdom of God or not ready to be harvested for the kingdom of God. There will come a time when everything is ripe, ready to be harvested. God determines when it's ripe. It's not our job to determine, oh, I think Pastor James is ripe now. He's ready for translation. No, that's not our job. God knows when the harvest needs to come, but the growing process is not forever. That's why it's so vitally important that we sow the seeds now. It's so vitally important that we have the right conditions and we choose Jesus now. Today is the day of salvation. Make a choice. Don't put it off for tomorrow and the next day and the next week or the next month because the growing process will not last forever. Let's switch to the second parable in our remaining few moments. This is the parable of the mustard seed. We're still in Mark 4, just the next verse. Verse 30, then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. Now the Jews had a uh, expression, small as a grain of mustard seed that they used to use. It was for something exceedingly minute. I don't believe, I did a little research, I don't believe a mustard seed is the actual smallest seed that exists. It's probably one to two millimeters in diameter, but it would be the smallest of the seeds that we plant. Mm. So this would be truly the smallest seed that we plant. Probably Jesus is talking about a black mustard seed. They say, if you read, 700 seeds can fit into one gram. That's a lot of seeds. Mm. That's a super small seed. Takeaway number five. If the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, small beginnings are God ordained. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Think about John the Baptist. He was clothed with a garment of camel's hair. People said he looks, he doesn't look like someone who's gonna be the forerunner of the Messiah. He's out there preaching for six months and look what happened. Think of Jesus Christ. If people had looked at him with physical eyes, they would have said he's just a dusty itinerant preacher. Look what happened. Think of the 12 disciples. Jesus spent three and a half years pouring into them and they all forsook him at the cross. Look what happened when they turned the world upside down. Think about the 120 disciples in the upper room praying before Pentecost, seemingly afraid of the Jews. Look what happened with Pentecost. Small beginnings are God ordained. Keep reading Mark 4, 32. When it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Takeaway number six, end results are God given. So even if a small beginning, it's God ordained, but the end results are definitely God given. In Israel, they found mustard trees that grew to a height of 12 feet. Now that's incredible on the Jordan River. Now most mustard trees don't grow that high, 
But what does that mean? The growth is disproportionately large. In other words, you and I open our hearts and minds to the Lord Jesus and the work he can do in our lives, in our communities, in our churches is incredible. Submit yourself to God and watch him grow the mustard seed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill, James, John, and Daniel. This has been a wonderful lesson. We have just a moment for a quick thought to the end of your day. You bet. It's, it's almost the end of July right now. There's still a little bit of time. I would encourage you, if you have opportunity, plant a seed somewhere and then pray and say, Lord, teach me what there is to learn from the soil and from the seed. I think the lesson brought out of my day was, are you prepared to hear what the Lord is ready to tell you? Your prayer should be, Father, open my eyes, open my ears, give me a willing spirit to be willing to hear what you're about to share with me. Amen. It's never too late to let your light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel, don't hide it under a bed, but let the light that God has given you shine in your community and in your family. I think in the parable of the seeds, to me, what I really took away is God's responsibility and my responsibility. Sometimes we get those two confused and we think we have God's job and then we don't understand we need to let him do God's, his job. But we also need to do our part in sowing the seed. Amen and amen. This is such a beautiful study. And you know, we don't sit here and just read to you from the study. So we hope that you will get an adult Bible study guide, but perhaps you would like our notes. You can email us at ssp at 3abn.org and get the panelist notes. Now, I just want to remind you that all of your potential is in God's word. It's in the seed of his word. He can develop a great harvest in you. So seek the Lord uh, while he may be found. And join us next time. Lesson five will be miracles around the lake. We're so glad that you're with us. We pray that the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you today and always. Bye-bye.